Welcome everyone to our webinar, How You Can Safeguard Your MSPs Using Security Vendor Managed Services. Before we get started, we have some information for our attendees. You can hear our presenters using computer or phone. You all are muted right now, so if you have questions during our webinar, please utilize our question or chat features found on the right-hand side of the WebEx window. We are monitoring these and will answer your questions. If there are any questions that we don't get to during this webinar, we, you will receive responses afterward. This webinar is being recorded live and will be shared on our website as well as YouTube. For those that are looking to earn CPE credits, this webinar will apply. Now on to our presentation. I'm your host, Diana Harder. I'm the Audience Marketing Manager at WatchGuard and have developed the webinar series, Top Opportunities for MSPs in 2023. This webinar is the final episode of this series, and I feel it comes at a perfect time to talk about vendor managed services. I'd like to introduce you to our subject matter experts. First, Mark Romano, our Senior Director of Channel Success, who really drives the bond between our global partners and WatchGuard's marketing strategy. And Scott Williamson, our Director of Managed Services, who is building and bringing our partners managed service security services, which are effective, efficient, and easy to consume. Now, before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have some WatchGuard swag up for grabs for our top 20 audience participants today. You can get participation points by asking questions, responding to our polls, and participating in our chat. Okay, so your first opportunity. We'd like to get to know a little bit more about who you are in our audience and what interests you about our topic today with two poll questions. So the first one, as you can see, is which security vendor managed services have you used before? You can select just one or a couple. All right, let's give you guys about five more seconds. It looks like two thirds of you have, have voted. That's great. People are interested in the swag. All right. Okay, so it looks like 90% of you have used the managed firewall services. Looks like the next one is managed MDR XGR. That's interesting. And some of our other ones are the managed vulnerability scanning and managed awareness um, training. All right, nice. Okay, one more poll question for you. This kind of gives us an idea. Um, is how much of your security infrastructure are you having your vendor manage today? So which, which option looks like it's kind of fits your business model today? Good to see all of these responses rolling in. <laughs> all right, let's give you about five more seconds to respond. All right, it looks like you're in the right place. So less than 25% is the majority. We do have some that are utilizing it quite a bit. So it'll be interesting to see the differing perspectives on this topic from our audience. All right. Well, we'll have our first question with our, um, our uh, panelists here. So just curious um, from Mark and Scott, how do security vendor managed services differ from traditional? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. Um, that last that last poll question actually brings up quite of um, quite an interesting thought perspective as to how some of you got as far down the path as you did, how some of you have not, and where you all sort of fit in the middle. Um, so, Diana, thank you very much for asking those. Um, I have a couple of questions for Scott. Scott has, um, and I'm going to ask him to um, give us a little more detail. Scott comes to WatchGuard uh, from uh, an interesting background. 
And I think that background is going to provide a lot of you with some additional information on how to look at vendor managed services versus traditional. So Scott, can you describe from your point of view, sort of the difference between when a vendor gets involved supporting an MSP, um, how the vendor managed solution integrates into an overall stack? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Mark. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to take two approaches uh, when it comes to vendor managed services um, from, from a partner's perspective. Um, you know, a partner either has to decide, does, the, does he want the vendor to do it for me or does he want it to do it, do it with me, right? So, um, you know, a lot of times vendors will get into a, a do it for me, I don't have the expertise, I can't do this organically. Um, it, it's, not, it's not the core of my business. I just want somebody to do it for me, provide it to me, and I will work, you know, that way. And then you have other partners that say, hey, you know, I want you to do it with me. I want this to be part of my core service offering. I want to wrap services around it or wrap things around it. And, and you know, that, that's a little bit uh, different because there's an integration on the back end. There's integration within the service delivery um, of the service. So I think, you know, ultimately um, a partner has to decide, do I, do I want somebody to do it completely for me? or do I want them to do it with me and provide this to my clients? Yeah, let me, let me see if I can put this into some perspective as well. Do you see an opportunity entering a market sooner or providing a, a service to a segment sooner by using a better managed solution? Um, or is there more confidence in offering it through a traditional managed service model? How do you see that going? Well, no, I, I definitely think if, you know, things like time to market are important, um, you know, or or not having the expertise in hand, it's it's real easy to le lean on that vendor um, and that expertise. So um, I, I think, you know, getting to market quicker is definitely one of the, the things that they uh, need to take into consideration. Um, you know, I, I think a, a good a good analogy would be things like security awareness training, right? A, a partner could spend the time, could spend the effort in building the expertise in-house, building templates in-house, building training in-house and delivering those things. Or they could go out and find a vendor that's already got those um, available to them and work through that way. So it's really, you know, what what is the end game of that partner? Got it. Thank, thanks, Scott. I think we'll get to this a little bit later in the session is looking at speed and profitability as well. Um, how can um, an MSP look at a particular service and figure out is it easier or better for me financially to go with a, a vendor managed service as well. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Back to you, Diana. Yeah, thanks for answering those questions. I think the next question that comes up is um, how can security vendor managed services help an MSP differentiate? in the market? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I constantly try to understand how MSPs differentiate themselves um, using a particular set of services and whether a security vendor managed service makes a difference. Um, I'm going to go back to Scott for a minute and then um, we'll start to look at some of the program services here in a second. So Scott, when you look at an MSP. You've been an MSP prior. Um, you've worked for an MSP, um, used vendor managed services. Um, how did it affect your business? Um, and does it allow for that faster integration? Is there less training, uh, requiring less technical expertise? So it's more of a pass-through model. Um, I just kind of get an idea from your perspective on what that yeah. looks like. It's funny to talk about differentiation when you're talking about vendor managed services, right? Because if it's a vendor managed service, then, then you know, by definition, it's something that's available uh, to, you know, to, to partners across the globe. So how do you differentiate? Well, you know, the easy answer is, is hey, if it's a new market, if it's something that my clients haven't seen before, that, that's real easy, right? Go out, get the service start applying it, differentiate yourself because you're providing the service and no one else is. But 
more and more what we're seeing is partners taking these vendor managed services and kind of bundling them together and making their own out of you know the services that are being brought in so uh you know j just off the top of my head if you think about you know things like compliance or security um you know um compliance requirements and things like that we have a lot of partners out there that will grab different services different vendor managed services whether they're risk assessments or pen testing or or mbr and they'll bundle them together to create their own secret sauce their own service deliverable around that to say hey look we're providing this compliance bundle um, and in this compliance bundle there, there's many different pieces to it but at the end of the day we as your partner are providing this to you with this deliverable that that contains multiple different vendor managed services yeah it's pretty interesting as i kind of look at this as um, a faster integration how do i get something into my stack faster that maybe my customers are asking for um, if i have to spin up my technical expertise um, maybe i have to hire new people which is incredibly difficult today get those people trained maybe i do that over time and use a sure. vendor managed service first and use that as an example of how do i put this into my stack does my customer um group accept that because i'm still the front company i'm still that trusted advisor downstream right no absolutely i, I mean let, let's take something like mdr for example right we're seeing more and more demand for mdr out there whether it be from a compliance standpoint a cyber security standpoint or just a general security health uh standpoint well <laughs> If a client comes to a partner and says, hey, I need an MDR service, that, that partner has two choices, right? I can do it in-house or I can find a vendor that's going to do it for me. If I do it in-house, there, there's a lot that goes into that, right? I mean, there, there's solid understanding of the technology, there's staffing. I mean, 24 by 7 coverage, you've got to have at least six FTEs to be able to cover that, right? So there's a huge investment from a staffing standpoint. Um, and, and these are specialized staff when you talk about things, you know, specifically around MDR or pen testing or, or whatever it is. Then you have to define these policies, these processes, the service delivery model. What are we doing? And then once you get that all defined, you constantly have to improve on that. You constantly have to train. You constantly have to have the, these employees on the front lines. So, you know, when a, when a partner looks at the two options, a lot of times, just using a vendor to do that and worry about that, it makes more sense. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I kind of I kind of look at it the same way. Um, I've talked to a lot of partners out there, a lot of MSPs, and they view this, They first, I have to stand in their shoes. Um, I have to see what they're doing as a business and how they're going to market um, so that I can better understand how this might support them. Um, many of the MSPs have customers who are asking, so what is in your stack? Who are those vendors? What's the technology behind what you're doing? Others don't care. And I think it really varies depending on the type of, of customer, where they fit within, um, if we look at a spectrum from a small business customer all the way up to an enterprise customer, they're gonna have different requirements. So I think it's very interesting to see from the MSP side, where they feel comfortable using a vendor managed um, and how does that vendor managed security offering downstream so do they make it their own when the reports come out um, as you mentioned on the um, detection response side um, does it go back to the msp and the msp forwards it on to the customer or is it done in a different way and i think those are some of those options to look at as well yeah absolutely okay back to you diana yeah so i'm actually a little bit curious i know a lot of our partners when they're looking at mdr um, and thinking about offering it as a service are kind of looking at the future of how it's going to evolve i'm curious um scott and mark really from how how do you foresee mdr scaling as an msp's um, client base starts to grow you know i mean this is we're talking them to sort of depend on here we'll take care of this aspect but as their business starts to grow are we are vendors kind of set to grow with them and can they can they handle those increasing demands without sacrificing the performance mm. um so when i take a look at this i think the the mdr side of the business and when we look at what we're doing at watchguard and i'll have scott um 
um, approach this as well. I look at this as sort of staying just ahead of where the need is so that we're able to, to work with our MSPs for them to be able to provide that downstream. I think it's going to become more and more important as um, we find more people requiring cyber insurance. And this is going to be a requirement of that um, policy as well. So the MSPs are going to have to engage either directly with an MDR platform or have a vendor manage that um, for them because they're going to need to provide this downstream to their customer base. Scott? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing a shift, right? Um, you know, as Mark alluded, I've, I've been in the MSP game for a long time. And, um, you know, it's funny, four or five years ago, uh, when you're talking cybersecurity insurance, um, you know, just in general, um, I, I remember the forums coming to the MSP that said, do you have endpoint protection? And that was a checkbox, you know, and you send it in and you get cybersecurity insurance. And then, you know, a few years ago, it was, hey, do you have EDR, right? Okay, yes, I have EDR, right? So it got a little more specific. Now we're seeing insurance forms coming in and saying, hey, is somebody monitoring the EDR or are you just letting it go? So from a cybersecurity insurance uh, piece, we're definitely seeing that. But we're also seeing it from a compliance standpoint. Uh, we're seeing more and more compliance being pushed down to, to the smaller S&B market, right? So, you know, uh, years ago, we, it was major enterprise, you know, things like CMMC, you know, on, on major, um, uh, major manufacturers and things like that. But, you know, now we've got, you know, uh, PCI V4 coming out. We've got CMMC V2. We've got um, you know, uh, even Motion Picture Association has their own compliance requirements, right? And so we're seeing more and more of this getting pushed down uh, from a compliance standpoint as well. So I think, you know, to, to answer Diana's original question, scalability has always got to be a concern. Um, and it's either going to be a concern for the partner or it's going to be a concern for the, the vendor who's providing the service to the partner. Um, I can tell you from our perspective, you know, We've spent a lot of time around collecting metrics and understanding, you know, scalability and uh, fluxing and things like that. And, you know, as I said at the beginning, you can either do that internally and worry about staffing and ramping and doing that, or you can find a vendor whose, you know, job it is to make sure that they can scale. Excellent. Thank you both. I kind of wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk a little more about our partner um, program services that that can be offered as part of this vendor managed services. We'll start off with a poll question. So with which security vendor um, partner program services have you had success? So mark any or all that apply. Curious to see what our audience um, experience has been so far. It's interesting to see the results change as more people vote. <laughs> All right, let's give you about five more seconds to respond and then we'll take a look at the results. Great participation today, by the way. All right, so it looks like the majority have had success with the training and certifications program as well as flexible payment and licensing options. And then it looks like extended product and service trials and uh, vendors who assist growing your market are the neck kind of tied for a third there. That's pretty interesting. It really is. They're, they're so close together, Diana. Yeah. That, um, it, it really is. So um, we're gonna get to partner programs in a bit, um, but just to comment on that, I think um, for those of you who have not gotten involved with the partner program yet, I would recommend whoever it is, take a look at it because you're going to find some profitability options there, but you're also going to find some other interesting options within that. Um, and before we get to the next thing, Diane, I just want to say there's only about, it's a very small group today, which is great. There's only about 40 people here. If you guys want to put anything in the chat, 
by all means, please put something in the chat. We will answer it um, probably right as we're doing this live. So if you have any questions that are coming up on um, how an MSP can engage with a vendor, um, if you're looking at um, profitability, if you're looking at marketing, if you're looking at even pick a crazy technical question, we'll see if we can answer it for you. Um, we can absolutely do that. So, so don't hesitate to put something in the chat. Thank you guys for participating in the poll questions and of course our swag at the end. So for those top 20 participants, I, I gotta tell you, it's probably gonna be, you know, three quarters of this group's gonna get something. So make sure you get in there and <laughs> get in there and, uh, and participate. Diana? All right, so on to our next question. Um, curious about which partner program services help MSP differentiate? Yeah, and I'll kind of take this. I've got a question for you, Mark. You know, we talk a lot about product, tech stack, and so on, but no business survives without attracting new customers or without profit, right? Uh, how can a vendor partner program support this method of service and integrations delivery? Yeah, so there's a lot to this. Um, one of the things I think you need to be aware of is how does the company that you're working with, the vendor that you're that you are going to engage, how do they see you as a partner? Um, are you a delivery mechanism? Are you a marketing arm? Uh, do they require you to use their brand? There's a lot of questions there. There's also um, some interesting perspective in how you're buying the product and how you're compensated for buying that product. I'll give you some examples. We'll start there, then we'll work back to the other. Um, from my perspective and my role um, at WatchGuard, um, and what I always look at with respect to uh, partner programs, is profitability. Uh, when, when companies roll out great technology, things that are um, really needed in the marketplace, um, you also need to take a look at, as a vendor, the profitability of that partner and how do we ensure that we're going to market the way that partner wants to go to market. So um, if you go way back, and there's still a lot of companies that do this today, there's what we call transactional partners and they're people who buy product and then they resell it um, and they don't do anything after that except maybe call for a renewal three years down the road. Um, over the last several years, many partners um, have gotten involved in managed services. And I think much of that has been driven by the buying community itself. They're realizing that there are some options of not actually owning the product outright, um, paying for it on a monthly service fee, um, and ensuring that the MSP side from a vendor, that when you build your stack, that that stack actually provides for not only the cost of the product, but cost of your technician's time, all of the training that goes in, all of the expertise, and you're still profitable on the other end. So some of the some of the options here when we're taking a look at the uh, MSP um, vendor offerings is to be able to provide you the purchasing portion of the product the same way you sell it back to your customer. So for example, um, rather than have you as an MSP pay for something outright and say, whatever the number is, say it's $10,000, you have to pay for that outright. And then it takes you on a three-year cycle to bring that money back in. That makes it very challenging for you as an MSP. So the partner program has to be set up such that you're able to buy and sell the way you want to. If you're selling monthly, you should be able to buy monthly. But eat, even that has to have profitability built into it. Um, so we look at that quite a bit. Uh, as you are uh, managing seats, we look at ways to create tiering for the pricing. So for example, if um, you come to a vendor and you want to start using their managed services, ask them, how am I going to pay for this? Am I going to pay for this based on the seats for your product? Or are you going to give me a discount for all of the seats that I manage? Because more than likely, I'm going to put this into the stack and then offer it to my community. So there's lots of ways to look at and create questions for your vendor so that you can really understand how you can build profitability into this model. One of the other things to look at, um, and I think most of you probably do this, um, is when you go into the managed services business, you're actually selling yourself. You're not selling the vendor. You may have a vendor stack that has a variety of uh, vendors in it, um, but you're really selling you because you're the trusted advisor downstream to the customer. Um, so what does the uh, vendor provide you to do marketing? Are they offering you uh, marketing options that are co-brandable? 
Um, are they offering you things that are rebrandable so you can create demand for that product? Are the reports set up in such a way that it's your logo on the report, not the vendor's logo on the report? All of that should be in the conversation with respect to the partner program and the profitability that that partner program offers you. All right. Uh, do you see similarities between the types of partners and their needs with respect to managed services? Um, categorically, I would say that there are similarities, um, but you have to kind of look at who the partner is providing services to. So a smaller MSP, um, let's say servicing a small to medium business space or a small business space, they have very similar types of needs. They would like the vendor um, to work more on their behalf. They don't necessarily have a lot of people in the company. They need assistance in making that happen. Some of the much larger companies say, look, this is our stack. This is how it works. Let me know what my pricing is and keep that pricing as standard as you possibly can, because I don't want to have to change um, my pricing on the stack and I don't want to have profitability vary. So when we build rebates, when we build discounts, all of those things that go into a partner program, we look at the MSP and say, well, the MSP would like all of the funding up front. So we're going to take away the rebate that you have to worry about in the back end. We're going to move that to the front and create that upfront discount for all of what we consider now instead of transactional as managed products so that you can have a very consistent delivery model um, of a stack of, of products at a very consistent price that you don't have to worry that the vendor is moving around the pricing. So it does vary depending on who the partner is actually servicing and what those needs are of that partner community. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, Diana? Yeah, so Mark, I have a, a kind of a follow-up question for you. So I know as I've been talking to different MSPs out in the field, I know that a lot of them, as they're trying to attract new customers, they feel like it's a little bit difficult because they don't have a dedicated marketing person to help create materials. So I'm just wondering if you can share with our audience here about what what can a vendor provide to help with marketing support? Yep, you bet. So there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is financial and one is physical. Uh, does the vendor that you're working with provide you with market development funds? Are you able to accrue co-op funds um, on the back end of sales? Is there funding available for you to go to market with? That's one piece. That doesn't really help if you don't have anybody in house that is a marketing person or a demand generation person. What the vendor should also be offering you is a channel marketing or field marketing team that can work with your company and develop over time these go-to-market stories. So they can help you market yourself downstream. It's not necessarily about, in the MSP world, it's not necessarily about the vendor's name per se. It's more about being able to market you and the capabilities that you're providing, which is what you've done by coming back to the vendors and say, okay, let me see what fits into my stack. How does it service my downstream customer? But as Diana said, how do I actually deliver that message? And being able to look at uh, your market, to be able to look at who you're servicing, um, and to be able to deliver that message. I'll give you an interesting anecdote. Um, we had several years back, we had a partner conference, and I went through several questions. And one of the questions, was do you know your top three vertical markets that you service? And I only had a few hands go up in the room. And I found that rather fascinating because your vertical markets and all of you have them. Um, all you have to do is go digging into your customer profile because if you have expertise, I'm just gonna throw one out there. If you have expertise in the energy sector, you should be talking to other customers potential customers in the energy segment. Because not only do you have the expertise to be able to deliver the managed services, the security services downstream, you also have expertise in their business line. And that's one of those ways to make sure that you're taking the information that your vendor provides you, you're using what you already have, your own knowledge base, and then delivering that downstream into the market. So it's a great way to create demand for your company. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we've got a question that came from one of our audience members, um, and Scott, I think this is a good question for you. Uh, the, our, the 
person who asked this question is wondering, how does MDR work practically when something happens? Um, do you contact the MSP to do something or, you know, explain a practical example? And it, they did mention, you know, let's say that an Excel with a dangerous macros is opened by an end user. You know, what do you do in that scenario? Yeah, so, so I think that really depends on the vendor and the solution that you're looking at. I can speak to what we do here at WatchGuard, um, you know, and, and our MDR response would actually stop that action. It would, um, you know, eventually if we needed to even isolate the devices on the endpoint. Um, but without getting into too much detail about, about our MDR, as we're, we're trying to leave this just kind of open, um, we are a channel focused company, right? So we work with our partners. It's, it's our job to, to prop our partners up and to allow them to do what they do best, which is to interact with the client. So even though we would protect the client, we would work through the partner and say, hey, partner, we stopped this threat. This is what we saw. You need to reach out to your client and explain to them that, you know, they shouldn't be doing this. Um, you know, uh, here's what we need to do from the remediation side. Uh, but we work through our partners because we are a partner for this country. That's a, that's an interesting point, Scott. Um, one of the re <laughs> there's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons we work through our MSPs, um, as Scott just mentioned, so on the MDR side that we have you deliver the message, is WatchGuard is a channel only company. Um, we don't do anything direct to an end user customer everything goes through the partner. So we try and work with the partner as closely as possible for them to be able to deliver a concise message um, that an end user customer can understand uh, rather than have us make that delivery. Because if a, if a uh, end user customer is back and says, well, I should just do business with that company who contacted me, they, they literally can't. We do everything through the channel. So that's one of the benefits for an MSP um, is looking at um vendors that don't have a direct model um, because you're secured in controlling that customer as well even in delivering a bad message thanks um and thank you chris for asking that question we hope that as people have more questions please do ask them in the question or in the chat um but as a way to sort of break the ice with the chat we're going to break it up a little bit and um we have a fun little question for you so today, whether or not you knew it, is Chaos Never Dies Day. <laughs> so to acknowledge that, we have kind of a fun little um, question for you here. So we have a quote by Sun Ju that says, in the midst of chaos, there is also blank. So go ahead and open up your chat and put in what your guess could be. We'll give you about 10 seconds to do it. So don't Google it. Really just try to see what you think it could be. <laughs> That's a great guess. We have tranquility as a guess. Anyone else? They're all quickly going to Google. Calm. Fast, fast, fast. Two people think calm, order. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely along the same lines here. Um, the answer is actually opportunity. So, oh, good job, James. <laughs> <laughs> Got it in the nick of time. <laughs> um, so go ahead and advance to the next slide. We really want you uh, to kind of see, like, embrace the chaos of cybersecurity for the business opportunities. We really do see it that way. Mark and Scott, do you have any comments about that? I, I can't disagree with this. Um, I think every time that there is an action that takes place in the market, good or bad, um, people will react to it. Every time they react to something in cybersecurity, there's an opportunity for you either to bolster what you're already doing with customers so they feel comfortable that they are working with the right company or to go get new customers that have not engaged yet to be able to counter whatever happened in the cybersecurity space. Yeah, no, I would agree. I don't really have much to add. That's okay. <laughs> All right, we wanna hear from our audience one more time. We have another poll question for you. So we're curious, how do you see managed security vendor services helping your business to grow? So if it's one or any of these options, go ahead and select. Curious to see what you all think now that you've heard a bit more from Scott and Mark.
All right, so far we have increased revenue, got 100%. Oh, no, it just went down. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you all think that. <laughs> or you thought that for a hot minute. Okay, let's give you all five more seconds and we'll see how we ended up. Okay. So yeah, increased revenue still, okay, that's great. We're glad you think that. And then second was tied for faster incident response times, very important in this line of business. And then offers more security sophistication to existing customers. To, yeah, that's that's very true. So, and then enables my team to focus on the core business was lower down. All right. Well, thank you all for participating in that. Um, we've got another poll question for you. Um, we go ahead and advance one more. Okay. I think it's just one more, Liz. Oh, never mind. It was that one. <laughs> Which security vendor managed services? Okay. Oh. No, nope, we went to our very last one. Sorry about this, but we can answer this now. Um, just curious, for next year, which topics would you like to learn about from WatchGuard? Um, this is, like I said, the end of a, of a series um, that we have specifically for our MSP audience, and we're curious to hear from you which ones you would be interested in learning about next year. Or if you have an idea, please let us know in the chat. We really do consider them. Oh, excellent participation. Ooh, okay, sassy, somebody said. All right, it looks like next generation of cybersecurity in 2024 and beyond, that's the winner. Okay, good. I'm glad we're that we're thinking along those lines. And then tips to qualify and attain cyber insurance. We actually are going to be talking about that in January. So that's a, I'm glad that you all are um, looking forward to that. And then learn how to set your MSP apart from competitors. Okay. Thank you all for letting us know that. We are, we are having a little bit of glitches on the technical side, but we'll go ahead and advance to the next question. <laughs> Sorry, we had our very last poll question come up. But how can your MSP increase revenue using vendor managed services? This is for Scott and Mark. Yeah. All right, so there, there are some interesting things here, although I'm going to throw it to Scott first because I want to see what he comes back with. Um, so we've got you know a number of MSPs here. They've already answered some of the poll questions with respect to this. Um, many of them have already determined a vendor or vendors to standardize on. How does this model help increase revenue? Um, is it an opportunity for people to switch vendors within their vendor stack to increase revenue? Um, what do you think some of those some of those options are? Well, I think you know, um, first of all, it, it it may be a totally new service, right? It may be a totally new revenue stream for that partner. Um, you know, again, if they're not doing MDR today and they have demand for it, or they need that, you know, um, once educating their clients, uh, create a demand for. It, that's that's a brand new revenue stream, right? That that is something that they they do not have today. Um, maybe it helps them bring in some maturity to what they're already doing, right? That would be another um, way that it could help uh, drive revenue is you know just by providing a more mature uh, service. So I, I think there's a couple different ways uh, that that can be done. Um, but yeah, and, and you know on top of that, being able to provide these services without having the capital outlay, the expenses of traditionally trying to provide these services themselves, right? Um, especially when we talk security-based managed services. Um, you know, as everybody in this webinar knows, when you start talking security personnel, when you start talking security analysts, incident responders, threat hunters, things of that nature, those are, those are all very expensive resources and they're, um, they, they're continuously expensive because you're having to invest in training 
um, and everything with them. And they're traditionally hard to hold on to. Uh, they're in high demand. So um, I think, you know, just from, from a, a COG standpoint that, you know, you can, by outsourcing some of this or by using a vendor, um, you know, you can save on those aspects as well. Yeah, I think um, uh, there's you know, a couple of ways to look at this. I tend to look at this from a ramp perspective. Um, if you need to get something into the marketplace quickly, there's a request for something that you don't have expertise on, this is a great way to do it. Um, if you don't have expertise on staff, rather than hiring people before you have uh, generated income, for a particular service, this is a great way to do it. Um, you can always switch later. If you decide that you can do it better or more profitably, use the same product, but don't have it vendor managed, that's a great option as well. So it's really sort of this process of bringing new things into your tech stack, um, hiring people at the right time, and remaining first and foremost revenue forward profitability needs to go right along with that so the thing that to keep in mind also on vendor managed or even in your vendor stack because you will have consistency in that stack over time if your technical folks that are responding to things or installing or managing are doing the repeatable exercise your profitability will go up as more customers come on board because you're your technical people will be re doing repeated tasks rather than having to learn something new each time, right? So as you bring on new technology, sometimes it's it's better for an MSP to have it vendor managed for a while, let them kind of go through that process with you and then take it over if you feel like that's the right way to go. Diana? All right, so our um, final question is curious about what are the best ways um, to evaluate a security vendor managed service? And this is really for both of you, just curious what your perspectives are. This is a fun one because I can just give you my company line or I can answer this as, a, <laughs> as, an, as an open book on how to evaluate a security vendor. Um, but I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna go to Scott first. Because if I go to Scott first, he'll probably answer half of it and then I only have to answer half on the back end. So go for well, it, Scott. Yeah, I think you know the first thing you need to do is understand what your requirements are, right? Uh, do, I, do I need a vendor to do it for me? Do I need a vendor to do it with me? Um, I think you need to identify that. I think you need to understand the, the depth of the, the managed service. Um, you know, and Mark, I think you brought up a, a very valid point earlier when it talks about the, the program, the partner program, you know, does this, am I going to eventually be competing against this managed service provider? Um, and, and, you know, like I said, I've been in the industry long enough to know um that at the end of the day um a, a lot of companies that that are direct or channel focused if, they, if they're both right if they're both in the channel and they sell direct at some point you're going to run across them um directly and so i, I think that's an important thing to look at as well mark yeah it really is um a couple of things to consider when you're looking at a vendor um and, and i say this a lot because i'm in the channel side of the business you know, people don't come to a partner program first. They don't go, wow, that's a really nice partner program you built, Mark. It's got great profitability and discount and rebates and everything else. And then go to the product and go, oh, wait, your product doesn't work. Make sure that you're looking at products that work first. That's usually where everybody goes. Does, does it hit all the check boxes? Then go to the company and how they treat their partners and determine if it matches what you do as a company because if it doesn't if it doesn't provide you with the extra opportunity to go after a market maybe that's not the right company to go with there are a lot of products that do the same thing out there in the marketplace they have different prices they have different little things but a lot of them work exactly the same but when you come right down to it does the vendor understand your business can they work with you the way you want to be worked with? Do they have a staff in the field to be able to support not only your marketing side, but also the technical side? Can they assist you? 
in putting a product into your vendor stack effectively? Do they offer proof of concept? Do they have trials? Do they have demos? Do they have all of these things that you need to feel comfortable that this is the right solution that you're gonna risk your company on with your customers? Because you're now going to incorporate this into your security stack. Do you feel comfortable enough to offer that to your customers? If the answer is yes, then you probably got the right security vendor. If the answer is no, you should keep looking and don't sacrifice the entire package for a particular technical feature because at the end of the day, it's probably not going to work long term for you. Diana? Yeah, we had a question come through our audience that I'm curious to see what you both think. So they asked, there's some certifications that must be achieved for delivering SOC or MDR, like SOC 2 frameworks, both international and local, and some even demand national storage of privacy data and national certifications, et cetera. How, like, how would we fit these requirements? Uh, well, the question is, do you want the marketing answer or the real answer? I'm going to give it to Scott. Go, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so so there, there are definitely certifications out there. I think Mark kind of hit on this too, you know, and, you know, first of all, uh, you know, GDPR is, is a big deal, right? Um, we are a international company. Uh, GDPR is something that, that we're very familiar with, have to work through um, within our environment. So um, having a vendor that understands the certifications and the requirements around it, we are a SOC 2 type 2 company as well. Um, you know, and so, yes, you're right. There, there are certifications not necessarily required to provide MDR services or required to provide SOC services, but to give your customers, you know, especially when we're talking SOC 2 type 2, uh, giving your customers, um, you know, a, an understanding of what you're doing with data, what your policies are, how you're safeguarding those things as well. Um, every every country has different requirements. Uh, APAC definitely got some different um, um, requirements around it. Um, as in, you know, the U.S. and, and CMMCV2 and and some of those others. So um, you know, every every uh, solutions provider is going to have different attestations into what they're doing, how they're protecting that. And you're right, you have to align with what with what makes sense in the in the markets that you're serving. Yeah, one of the things um, to consider with your vendor, um, like we do with our company, uh, it, within our partner program, we have what we call certification training. Um, it's technical training on the product, to be honest with you. It's not exactly what you're asking for, which is the industry um, requirements. However, we do offer that. And, and what we provide our partner base uh, is discounts based on their certifications, so just training. Um, rather than volume. So even if you want to get into the volume game, um, eventually with a vendor, you may not get the best pricing day one. So one of the things to consider is doing certification training with a company like ours, because that will actually set your discount. From there, you can go into some of those other requirements. And as Scott said, GDPR is huge for us. Uh, we have a number of um, storage facilities around the globe. So data goes into those where they are required. Um, Europe has been on the forefront of this and it has started us down that path. Um, we use the GDPR requirements pretty much worldwide, even though they're not required in the States. Um, and it's really important for us to make sure that uh, we can um, help our partners uh, pass those certifications um, and have our technical staff, our sales engineers, et cetera, work with you to do that as well. All right. Well, we're coming towards the close of our of our webinar. I just wanted to give our audience a chance to ask any more questions if they had them. And while all of you are thinking, I have one more question for you. So this does come up, Mark and Scott, that as um, you know, where's a good place to start with these vendor managed services? Are there any products or services that should already be established? with customers before an MSP just goes straight to a vendor to get managed their, you know, the vendor managed services. I'm going to go to Mr. Expert. Scott? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think it's really around the maturity of the partner, right? Um, our managed services, are, are they beginning to manage 
the client's environments more than just break fix and things like that. You know, I mean, actually managing the client's infrastructure, their their information technology, if you will. Um, you know, it's hard it's hard to sell um, managed services into an environment that that you don't manage, right? So I think there's some maturity around that, but I think you know we as a company and, and other companies out there are trying to make these services uh, more easily consumable right uh, regardless of how the, the you know how mature the partner is so I think we as an industry are doing a better job at making them more easily consumable and i think the industry is also changing into more of a managed you know let's get out of the break fix world let's get into the managed services world i don't know if you have anything to add to that, Mark. Yeah, Scott, I, it, absolutely dead on. Um, one of the things that we look at at WatchGuard is not trying to drive the market in a particular direction, but to evolve with the market as it moves. Um, we will continue to have transactional SKUs, transactional uh, partners uh, that are just simply moving product. Um, and then we have partners who are somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. I'll bet if I take a look at the 40 people, for example, who are on this call, uh, three to 4% of you are full on MSPs. You haven't done a transactional deal in a year or two. There are others of you that have not done a managed services deal yet. And the rest of you sort of fall in between. Our goal is to be able to service appropriately all of you um, so that if you're doing transactional, we've got a way to manage that. If you're moving into MSP, we have some ways to help you do that as well. And if you have a sophisticated um, stack that you've been working with for a while, but you're looking for a new feature set or um, you're looking for some additional profitability, there are ways for us to work with you there. Um, so my recommendation is no matter where you are on the managed services spectrum, if you have a question, if you'd like to try out a product, if you'd like to try out a product in your stack, just reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to have the conversation with you. Um, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, that's okay. We've learned something, you've learned something, and um, we can go on our way. But I think the key here is to continue to have um, an open dialogue. Um, and to really understand what's going out there in the marketplace, we'll continue to do these webinars, um, whether they are focused on our products or they're focused on the marketplace, um, or simply looking at the cybersecurity future of what's going on. We will continue to have these vehicles for you to learn more. Um, and if you want to engage with us and interact, that would be great. We'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Thank you. We had two questions come in, which I think could be answered together, and it's probably directed more to Scott. So the first one is, what is the requirement for a partner um, to for a partner to have the MDR service? And then another one is, I think it's one of our existing partners said, I noticed that MDR is now on the EPDR screen. Is that for this service? Yep, those are, those are definitely aimed at me. Um, so yeah, so WatchGuard um, has released an MDR service um, that really piggybacks on top of EPDR, EDR, um, advanced EPDR, uh, basically providing SOC services around um, our endpoint protection. Uh, requirements, um, there, there's not a lot of requirements around it. We do require that a partner manage the environment. Um, because really we're focused on the live off the land style attacks. There's a lot of threat hunting involved. Um, we need to have somebody that we can reach out to uh, to understand what may be evolving in that environment if that partner is doing something within that environment. Um, so, you know, having, having management of that environment and having somebody that we can call if we have questions are the requirements around MDR. Uh, to Mike's question, uh, yes, um, the, the MDR toggle, um, once you are an MDR partner, that MDR toggle becomes available um, to where you can apply the MDR uh, service licensing uh, to specific tenants or clients within your WatchGuard cloud. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you all in our audience for your participation. We had a lot of participation today, so we will definitely collect your information and send you emails to get you that swag. So we appreciate all of you being here and thank you, Mark and Scott, for being our subject matter experts and helping answer all these questions.
You bet. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day.